Well, Mangabi, Senior Tanan, good evening, good evening. How are we doing this fine evening? Not too bad. Excited to get into the book of Proverbs. Let's open up our Bibles to the Old Testament. Naglikad na lang, you go backwards a bit from the new Matthew and head to the left by, oh, about a half a Bible. And you come to the book of Proverbs. We pick up in Proverbs chapter 20. You'll recall sa naglikad, as we've been going through this second major division of the book, you're dealing with what we call words of wisdom. They're going to be individual little one-verse quotes that Solomon gives us on a variety of different topics. Now, they are written in a style known as Hebrew poetry. Now, Hebrew poetry, very important, is always going to compare or contrast ideas. This is a truth. Kag, mayarapagid, here's a truth that builds upon that. Okon, here's a truth. Pero, here is the contrast to that truth. This is the way that a proverb works. This is the Hebrew poetry working with different thoughts, comparing and contrasting these ideas, which is always we're going to see on full display as we continue in Proverbs chapter 20 this evening. Now, As a reminder, we are going to be approaching the proverb a little bit different. I tried this last week in Nami and Ko. I thought it worked rather nice. Rather than going through verse by verse as none of them necessarily are connected, I thought let's group them together by content. Let's deal with all of the verses in the chapter that have a specific theme to them and that way we'll kind of organize the chapter a little bit neater rather than sulit sulit going back to the same ideas. So that being the case, the first section we're going to look at is called wise leadership and we're going to begin in verse 2. So Proverbs chapter 20 beginning in verse 2, we read, The wrath of a king is like a roaring of a lion. Whoever provokes him to anger sins against his own life. Now, when a lion roars, we talked about this last week, it is his way of establishing his authority. He's saying, I am in charge. I am the one who's in control. He's the one who's the big gahuna. He's the one that is over everybody else. If a king gets angry, what is he trying to tell you? I'm in charge. No one is over me. I'm the one who's in authority. And if you try to contrast that, if you try to go against it, you do so to your own danger. You may lose your life because you do not question the authority of a king. Now, it turns out this isn't just an Old Testament truth. This is also a New Testament truth. For in the book of Romans, chapter 13, verse 1, we're told we are called to submit to the authorities that God has placed over us. For there is no authority except what is given by the Lord. Meaning, by the way, Piscandian ka, doesn't make a difference if you're dead in the Philippines, kung namiyan ka ang mga goberno, kung namiyan ka ang presidente, kung ara ka sa biyak sa lugar. If you're in even like wicked countries, we would say godless countries. Iran, if you're in North Korea, tananta na mga tao, basta ara sila sa goberno, halin sa gino o ina. No one is there but by the will, but by the intention of the Lord. Now, the reason why we have a hard time with that is we go, but why would God put wicked men in positions of power. Doesn't God want godly men to be in rule? Doesn't God want there to be godly men who's overseeing? And the answer to that question is, yes, but it's not bad if they're not. Here's why. Kung mga tao sa gobyerno, perfecto sila, wala sa lahat, buo, buo, gid, ang kung kisang problema la lang is that people begin to put their confidence and trust in the government rather than God. If they're all not good people, then you realize and recognize, well, don't put your faith in them, which, by the way, do not put your faith in governments. There is no politician who's ever worthy of being trusted. All of them are sinners. All of them are failed and flawed. And that's by intention. We're not supposed to put our trust there. We put our trust in the Lord. But God does give them authority for a good reason. He gives them authority and you do not want to upset them because they carry the sword according to Romans chapter 13. They can execute if they need to. This is the idea. Do not upset. Do not get the king angry. 
But the hope is, let's move on to the second thing we want to look at in light of this wise leadership. The hope is, is that it is a just king. Look at verse 8. Jump down a bit to verse 8. Notice we read again. A king who sits on the throne of judgment scatters all evil with his eyes. In other words, kung may isa kahari, kung may goberno, biskansino lang, your leadership of a particular country, a particular government of a city, kung buot sila. If they are just, if they are righteous, just by looking out and watching out for the people, they're going to enforce righteous laws. They're going to make people do what is right. Now maybe you've noticed if you drive, if you don't drive, if you take the public transportation, probably not so much. But if you drive, like they're like crazy. I mean, genuinely crazy. They don't follow any rules, whatever they want to do, whenever they want to do it, but they did. It's actually quite an entertaining thing to watch. Why are people so wild? Why are they so crazy? Because although there are rules, nobody enforces them. You can do whatever you want to. A red light, that's optional. You can stop if you feel like it. If you want to, that's okay too. Hey, there's you know, a pedestrian crossing the street. He has the right of way. Not if I run him over. This is just the way people act because nobody enforces the rules. And this is the idea. A just government makes sure that rules are enforced so that the people are safe. He scatters evil. By enforcing the rules, watching out with his eyes. But jump down too, because we'll carry this same thought on. Look at verse 26. For we're told, likewise, a wise king sifts out the wicked. He makes sure that they kind of get sorted out. And brings the threshing wheel over them. Now I have to admit, I found this kind of entertaining. So it is a godly, just government that enforces rules and makes sure there's righteousness. They do so by making sure that evil has no place amongst the people. How do they make sure there's no evil? Well, they sift them out. They find them. What does a just government do when it finds evil people? They run them over. That's not an exaggeration. This is literally what Solomon says. They runs them over with a threshing wheel. And then they back up over them again. They make sure there's nobody left. They, they literally remove the wicked from a nation. And I like this. It speaks of zealousness. You want your leaders, those who were in charge, to have a zeal for doing what is right. They don't just enforce the laws, they're excited to enforce the laws. They don't just punish the wicked, they run them over and then back up over them again. That's the idea. They make sure the wicked have no place amongst the people of God. This is a just king. They enforce the rules and the laws of the land. But there's a balance. For notice I got the busan. There in verse 28, the final thing we notice about this wise leadership is that a king should be loving. Take a look. Verse 28 tells us, Mercy and truth preserve the king, and by loving kindness, he upholds his throne. There's two things a king should do. A leader. So it would be just Two things that are required for a government, a leader. They must have love. They must have truth. Both are important, by the way. Love speaks of their motivation. Why do they do what they do? Why are they serving the people? Hopefully because they love what they do. They love God and they love the people. Their motive is love. How, though, do they do justice? How do they deal between right and wrong? Well, they must have truth. Truth is the standard that guides these leaders. So truth becomes the what, love becomes the why. Both are important, pero más importante. The one that is the most important is the love. And please don't miss this. If a leader just has truth, he can tell the difference between right and wrong, good and bad. That's necessary. Pero kung wala palanga, 
If the motive for doing so is not love, it's not going to be good for it. He will not have his throne, his power established. Because he's not going to move by the right heart. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 through 3, a powerful, powerful chapter. Tells us, I can speak with the tongue of men and angels. Have all of the gifts of God. I can have all abilities, all prophecy. I can give all that I have to the poor. All of my wealth, all of my money. I can give my very life as a sacrifice. Pero, kung wala palanga, it means nothing. It counts for nothing. Love must be the motivation. It must be why we do what we do. It must be why a leader leads. And so you pull this all together. It's quite a powerful picture, by the way. There is authority given to our leaders. We should respect and follow our leaders, but we're hoping, mga moyo na lang, that they are godly, just leaders who enforce the law, who know the truth, but who have a heart of love. This identifies, this qualifies wise leadership. But that brings us to a second thing we want to look at this evening, and that's wise finances. Now, wise finances picks up in verse 4, so go back and trust you, Tai Lang. And we'll talk about, first of all, laziness. If we're going to be wise with our finances, we should not be lazy. For verse 4 tells us, the lazy man will not plow, kai, tagnao sa sagwa. It's winter time. He will beg during the harvest, though, and he will get nothing. So, let me give a little bit of geographical information para nakantindikita. Dito sa Israel, their planting season is in the fall, mga October, November, hasta mga January pa. And kung ara ka sa Israel, it's January, tagnaw tuod. In Jerusalem, the temperature can get down to zero, below zero, tagnaw, tagnaw git. And so the lazy man goes, ah, I'm not going to go out and plant anything. It's too much effort. It's too cold outside. I'm going to stay in here where it's nice and warm. The problem is if you don't go do the work, when you go to harvest, there's nothing to get. So what are you going to eat? Because you have no food to harvest, you're going to start begging. Please give me food. And you're going to get nothing because you did not sow. That's why you are not Reaping. Now, let me pull this into a spiritual context. It's very simple to understand the idea of sowing and reaping. If you don't plant the seed, you're not going to harvest any fruit. But the same truth also is in the Lord. The principle of sowing and reaping is a spiritual one. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. He who sows sparingly, In other words, we do not give our time. We do not give of ourselves to the Lord. We'll reap sparingly from the Lord. There's wisdom in this. We want to be diligent, not just diligent in our work ethic. We want to be diligent in the Lord. For those who are diligent work hard. For God will receive a good harvest. And don't go to sleep. Notice verse 13. Carrying on with this idea of don't be lazy. Do not... Proverbs chapter 20, verse 13. Love, sleep, lest you come to poverty. Open up your eyes, and then you will be satisfied with bread. <laughs> no, hapos lang ni. Kung nami ang kita motulog, pigara dayon. You will become poor very quickly. Because, please don't misunderstand, it's not that we should not sleep. We do need sleep, by the way. It's a requirement. It is something that's necessary. We ought to sleep every day. Just don't love sleep. It's the love of sleep that is dangerous. It's the love of sleep that we should not do. Because if you love sleep, you're not going to be working enough to be able to provide what is necessary. You're not going to eat well. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. The apostle Paul would say, Bera bera akon obra. And I work constantly. I work harder than anybody. Pero hindi ako. Isang gracia sing gina o salotsa ako. And it's the grace of God in me. But it should be the defining characteristic, please don't miss, of a Christian that we are hard workers. We are not tamaran. We are not lazy. We do not love sleep. We are those who are diligent, both in a worldly sense. We work hard. 
as well as for the Lord, we're diligent with our God. We are not lazy. But we also don't cheat. Look at verse 10. And then also verse 23, we'll read the two of them together. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 10. Diverse weights and diverse measures. They are both alike. They are an abomination to the Lord. Jump down to verse 23. Diverse weights are an abomination to the Lord, and a dishonest scale is not good. So if we are a merchant, kita. We're selling biscuit and olang. Whatever we're selling, if we sell it, I bet there's some nice, you know, you know, dragon fruit in the back. So, so Edna, when you're selling your dragon fruit, be very careful. <laughs> Make sure that your kilohan is really, really honest. That's the idea. Do not cheat people to try to get more from them. Now, this is a practical truth. Jin Jin has uh, got some markets that she likes to go to. They sell fruit and she pays attention. If she goes to a particular market and they do not treat her right, you walk up and you go, is this fresh? Oh, oh, ma'am, nami, 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 gid. Tuod na. Oh, 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 this is the best fruit there is. And then she, guys, she, she buys it and takes it home. It's, it's old, it's, it's rotten or whatever might be the case. She never goes back there. They did get her money once, but they'll never get it twice. If you know someone who cheats you, they, you, know, you go home and you, they weigh it and they say, this is two kilos worth of biscuit and olang. Okay, no problem. You pay for the two kilos. You get home and you go, Magane. this doesn't feel like two kilos. And you break out your kilo, hon, and you drop it on top and you go, 1.5 nalang. Guess what? They got your money once, but they will never get it twice. It's not worth it to cheat to try to make more money. You will lose in the end plus. My dugang pagid. God is not happy. He repeats it in two different ways. He says, number one, it's not good. Pero it's also an abomination. That's a strong word. It means, the Lord just does not like that. Therefore, for the sake of our business, as much more the sake of our relationship with God, we are not to cheat when it comes to finances. But there's a third one. Jump down with me to verse 14. We also are not to barter. I found this one unique. It is a good for nothing, cries the buyer. Cries the buyer. Pero, when he leaves, he goes, He goes, actually, this is really nice. In other words, as a tactic to try to get something at a lower price, what does someone say? This is terrible quality. And they try to downplay the value of something. Why? Get the price down. If I make it look like it's worth nothing, if I act like it's not very valuable, it tries to lower the price. But if I can buy it for that low price, oh, the moment I walk away, because I basically lied to you, cheated you to drop the price so I could get it for less than it was probably worth. We are not to do this. Now, this is hard for me, actually. I like bartering. I enjoy walking into a market. Other people, they don't enjoy this. I think it's fun. You walk in and they go, and they go, ah, yon toshentos, toshentos, and I start playing with them. I have fun with it. I think it's great. I remember one time I was in Russia and I wanted to buy a chess set. It's just a, a gift to give to somebody. And so I go up and I start the haggling process and we're arguing in rubles is the currency in Russia. So we're arguing in rubles. We got down to just a couple rubles difference and the man looked at me and he goes, Sir, for you, what is three rubles? It's nothing. For me, it'll feed my family for a week. I go, oh, ouch. Okay, you win, whatever you want. I'll pay you now. But, but the idea is fair. Don't try to take advantage of others. What something is worth, what is a fair value, pay it. Don't try to cheat people just to get it at a better price. Whatever it's worth, that's what we should pay. And don't give loans. Look at verse 16. 
Hindi mo utang. For Solomon goes on and says, Take the garment of the one who is a stranger for surety, and hold as a pledge when it is for a seductress. That probably takes a little bit of explanation. The two words are actually almost identical. Kung mautang, someone takes a loan from you, importante, wala kilala kasi ila. They're a stranger to you. They're not someone you have any kind of relationship with. When it talks about the stranger, lelaki. When it speaks of the seductress, it's kind of a bad translation. It just means, ang babay wala kilala mo. A woman that you don't know. So whether it's a man or it's a woman, the idea is if you don't know them, be very careful about giving them loans because you don't know what you're getting into. I'll take this a step further. For the New Testament principle is bawal gidn. Absolutely don't do this. Because according to the book of 2 Corinthians, we're told in chapter 6 verse 14, we are not to have fellowship with an unbeliever in that kind of a situation. Do not get into a business arrangement with someone who's not a Christian. Why? Because they're going to have a different set of values. If you loan them money, if you give them money, if you're in business with them, they might want to cheat. They might want to steal. They might not have a problem fudging on their taxes. They're going to do things we are not as Christians allowed to do and that will compromise our walk with the Lord. Therefore, be very cautious. Frankly, don't get into business. Don't give loans to those who are not believers, those who we do not know personally. But Solomon goes on. He gives us a fifth thing in regards to wise finances. Jump down to verse 17. And that's, we're not to be lying for the sake of our business. For bread gained by deceit tastes sweet. But afterwards, the mouth of that man will be filled with gravel. So, ano problema sa mga tao sa kalibutan? If they need to lie to make more money, no problem. You know, Marlon, I'm not going to pick on the real estate industry. <laughs> but let me pick on the real estate industry. There are things that they will say. That, I mean, they'll tell you whatever they need to tell you to close that sale. Yes, this is the best deal ever. Yes, the interest rates will never go higher. <laughs> it's all a lie. It's all not. But they're going to say whatever they have to say to make the sale. And it sounds sweet to them. They made the deal. They closed the bargain. But sa katapusan, it will become gravel or stones in their mouth because, I like this, they're not trusting in God, they're trusting in themselves. Let me draw an interesting comparison. When Jesus was being tempted by Satan in the wilderness, Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, what was the very first temptation? Gutom gidsha, ano hamba si Satan sa iya? Ara mga Bato. Have them turn into bread. I thought about that. Interesting connection because this is exactly what Solomon's talking about. You'll think you're earning bread, but you're going to get stones because Satan cannot provide. He looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, I know you can. You can take a stone and make it bread, but Satan could not. If we're looking to this world, if we're looking to the God of this world to provide, He cannot. We end up with stones, we don't get bread. But the opposite of that is true. According to Luke chapter 11, verse 11, Jesus said, Your heavenly Father would never give you stones if you ask for bread. Interesting, same terminology. You see, when we come to God, when we look to the Lord, we don't end up with stones. That's when we do get the provision, we do get the bread. Don't miss the point. If we work in the world's way, if we follow the world's system, to make that peso, the extra little bit of money, because we think that somehow it's going to make our ends meet, somehow going to make us blessed, you will not get bread, you will not get rice, you will get stones. For the God of this world, this world system will never bring blessings. We look to the Lord, for the Lord is the one, He alone, who can provide. And don't trust in inheritances. Look at verse 21. This one's a dangerous one. Dealing with wisdom regarding finances. An inheritance gained quickly at the beginning will not be a blessing in the end. In other words, 
Don't look for the easy money to be given to you by your family, from your relatives. I've known people, my problem is This is actually something that's very dangerous. Their thought is, my but when they die, I'm going to get rich then. That's when life's going to be easy. I'll have everything I ever wanted. Really? Are you sure? There's two major problems with that. Problem number one, what are you going to do until they die? Hulat lang ka, wala korta. You're just sitting around going, well, one day, maybe, maybe. Did. Well, no, they're still alive. Because <laughs> if you want someone to die, that's not a good place to be, by the way. That's not a godly place to stand. You're trying to, hoping someone goes to heaven or hopefully go to heaven because you want them. No, don't do that. Problem number two. Money that comes too easily ends up getting spent really easily. You get it, you get it, you receive it fast, but it goes really fast. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 11, money that comes quickly disappears quickly. That's the truth. Do not think that an inheritance is a blessing more than not. It is a curse. I'll give you a good example. Do you remember the prodigal son? Ooh, here's a good picture. Luke chapter 16, he came to his dad and said, Pa, give me my money. inheritance. Give me all that you were supposed to give me when you die. Gave him all the money. What did he do? Went out. Wasted it all. And then he was hungry. So hungry he ended up working for a farmer to feed pigs. And he was wishing he could eat what the pigs ate. Because he had nothing. And he had to go back broken to his dad. Now his dad received him. It's a beautiful story. But the point is the blessing wasn't the inheritance. It was actually a curse. Money easily gotten is easily spent. It's never going to be an answer. But sa pusan, true wealth, and I like this. True wealth is not money. Look at verse 15. There is gold and a multitude of rubies, but the lips of the wise, those who have knowledge, are a precious jewel. So, ano mas nami, ano mas sino? Mangarana, which has more money given from it? Precious jewels, diamonds. Diamonds are very valuable. They're worth a lot of money. Or the lips of those who speak truth. Wisdom in the heart of a man. Well, no comparison. No matter how many jewels you have, no matter how many precious gems you may possess, that money is temporary. It does not last. But the wisdom that comes from the Lord, the wisdom that comes from the Word of God, that brings eternal wealth. That's what gives us the hope of heaven. True wealth is not measured in pesos. It's not measured in dollars. It's measured in the knowledge of the Word of the Lord. That's what brings the greatest wealth of all. This brings us to a third thing we want to notice. Speaking of words, we want to look at wise words. Rewind all the way back to verse 1. For in the context of wise words, there's several things we want to notice what we should not do. What is unwise to say. And the first one comes when we're drunk. For wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. And whoever is led astray by it is not wise. So, kon mahubogita. Now, the wine suggests indi hubogid. If you have a little bit of vino, indi sobra sobra lang, but probably more than you should. We're not talking having a single cup with dinner. This is more probably than you should have in a sitting. You're not so drunk you can't stand, but you're still going to be a little looser with your lips. Your conversation probably is not going to be quite what it should be. Can your tipsy, the word might be, tipsy, not quite hubog, but not quite sober. Yeah, that can be a dangerous place. What comes out of your mouth, you may regret. If you take hard liquor, then do I. Hubog ka na, maawai ka. That's when you're going to get drunk and get into fights. That for sure is not going to go well. You are deceived and there is no wisdom in you. Which of course brings up the very potent question. 
Can we, should we drink? Turns out those are two different questions. Puede, can we drink? Yes. There is no biblical mandate that prohibits drinking. Can we be drunk? That one is described. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18, we are told, do not be drunk. Instead, be full of the Holy Spirit. Now, if we can drink, can't be drunk. If we can drink, that's the second question. Should we drink? That is a question only God can answer. We need to go to the Lord and say, Lord, do you want me to? Should I? Is it okay if I do? And let me tell you, be honest. Depends sa tao na lang. Ang iba, nilahambala lang, hindi pwede ko. And if the Lord says, do not, hindi pwede tood. Because different people have different levels of tolerance. Different people are stumbled in different ways. What may be acceptable to one is not acceptable to another. So God is the one we must go to and say, Lord, can I? If God says, pray day, okay, don't get drunk and be careful of your brother. But no, that when you have too much, for sure you are not wise for you will say and do things that you will regret. Number two, it's not just no drinking. We're also not to argue. Take a look at verse three. It is honorable for a man to stop striving since any fool can start a quarrel. Now, powerful truth. It's not to start an argument. It's hard to end an argument. Anybody can start an argument. I mean, just a fool. They can start an argument. That's easy to do. But it takes an honorable man. Someone exceptional to be able to have the wisdom to control your emotions. Come to the grace of God so that you can control your reactions. And in humility, stop the argument. That is is what shows someone who has the Holy Spirit working within them. James chapter 3 says, listen, it's tiny, our tongue is small. What our tongue can do is incredibly dangerous. Small but deadly. He said, if you can control your tongue, if you can stop that little thing from doing what it wants to do, you can control your whole body. That's the hardest thing to stop. Therefore, it is wisdom to know how to control our words and stop an argument. But we get that low. It's also wise not to gossip. Look at verse 19. Jump down a bit. For he that goes about is a talebearer, bearer merites. This is a gossiper. And reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with that one even if they flatter with their lips. So listen. Pamati na lang. Kung kilala mga tao, you know them. You know that they're famous for telling stories. Now maybe you know them because you like to hear their stories. Namin kamapati sa ila. You like going and listening to what they have to say. But you know their personality. You know what they do. If you know their character that they tell stories, don't give them more. <laughs> don't go and tell them their stories so they can tell others. Because for sure, if they tell you, they're going to tell others as well. You know their character. There's an old saying. Hurt me once, shame on you. Hurt me twice, shame on me. I should know better. And the whole idea is if we know someone's character, we need to be wise concerning them. Do not invest in them. Do not entrust with them very personal truths because they've already told us. They've already shown us. They're not going to hold on to them. They're going to quickly pass them on to others. Beware of those who gossip. But also don't curse. Jump down just one verse to verse 20. For whoever curses his father or mother... His lamp will be put out into deep darkness. Now we need to clarify. What does it mean to curse? Are we talking about, you know, just you know, you just you know, let out some explicative words towards your parents? It goes deeper than that. 
The idea means literally to despise, to detest, to actually hate your parents. The one who has that level of hatred towards his parents will not last long according to the law. His lamp will be put out. What does it mean his lamp will be put out? But thy Go back to Exodus chapter 21, verse 17. The one who curses his mother or father is to be executed, to be put to death. Now, the New Testament gives greater greater clarification on this, and I want to go here because this helps us. According to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, and that's the important verse. Ephesians 6, 1 gives us two different classes of ginikanan, two different kinds of parents. He goes on to say, Paul declaring... You who have parents in the Lord, you obey them. Basta ma Dios nga ni ginikanan, masunod sa ila, mapamati sa ila, you follow them. You who have parents, basi ni Dios nun sila, basi pasabat sila, basi pasuway sila, you still honor them. That they may be well with you and you may live long upon the earth. Now here's the thought. We may not have good parents. I want to clarify this because maybe you can relate. You're going, I have parents, but they're not good. Understood. You're not bound to obey them because their example might not be a good one. We still must honor them. What does that mean? Show them Jesus. Show them grace. Show them love. Show them kindness. You're going, well, pastor, they were not good. They were very bad. Yes, they're bad. That's why they need Jesus. (laughs) That's why they need the Lord. Therefore, we give them honor in the hopes they will come to the Lord. That's the thought. Be a good example to ungodly parents. But even if you don't have godly parents, you may have godly examples who are spiritual parents to you. Give an example. I, I was very blessed, to be honest, and I understand. I had blessed, I was very blessed with very, very godly parents. And they were incredible in the impact they had upon my life. But I also have other men that I look at as spiritual fathers. In particular, my pastor back in the States, Pastor Clark, some of you have met him. He has been an incredible influence, had a powerful impact upon my life. And the example of what it means to be a pastor, what it means to be a godly leader, profound as far as how it's influenced me. And absolutely, I looked at him as a spiritual father. So I would obey him. Why? Because spiritually, God has put him in my life as an influence, as a godly man. And that's the thought. We obey those who are our godly influences. We honor even if they are ungodly because we do not want to be like the world. We do not want to curse our parents. But that brings us to a fifth thing we want to look at in regards to words, and that's vengeance. Look at verse 22. Just jump down a couple of verses. Solomon goes on to say, Do not say, I will recompense or repay evil. Wait for the Lord, and He will save you. Now please pay attention to this one. It is not for us to get even with those who have hurt us. That's what we want, but it's not what we do. Why? We're not good at it. We're really bad at it, to be honest. You go back, you may have heard the law. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. If you take out my eye, I get to take out yours. If you break out my tooth, I get to take out your tooth. And that sounds kind of mean, like, wow, that's harsh. You get to take someone's eye. It's not harsh. It's limiting. I can only do what you have done to me. That's not what we want. Someone hurts us. We want to devastate them. You hurt my eye, I want to take off your head. (laughs) You hurt me, my body, I want to put you six feet in the ground. That's our human nature. We don't want justice. We want vengeance. And vengeance is not ours. 
because we are not just. We do not do it in a godly way. What's our part? You're going to love this. What do we do to those who harm us, hurt us, that we want to ultimately get back at because of what they've done to us? Luke chapter 6, we love them. Palangga kita sa ila. We love those who harm us, love those who hurt us, pray for those who spitefully use us because that's how our God is. And then we trust God to be the one to bring justice in due time. Go back to Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will be the one to repay. We do not seek vengeance. Nor should we take vows. Jump down to verse 25. For it is a snare for a man to devote rashly something is holy and then afterwards reconsider his promise or his vow. In other words, be careful what you say. Be careful what you promise. Be careful what we say to the Lord. If you get me out of this mess, I'll go to church every week for the rest of my life. Last for two weeks. Careful. When we make a vow, we make a rash decision, when we dedicate something as holy, separated for the Lord, God holds us to that. Be careful with rash words. There was a judge in the book of Judges chapter 11, Ianalan Jephthu. Jephthu had an interesting problem. He had the armies of the Amalekites, Israel. all of these armies of Amalekites coming against him. He said, Lord, if you give me the victory, the very first thing to come out of my house when I come home, I will offer as a sacrifice to you. Okay, rash vow. Offering something to the Lord without stopping to think about it first. Off he goes to battle. The Lord was with them. Nagda Oksila, the Amalekites, they lost. He, home, he comes home. Lipa Lipa gets He's all happy because he's won the battle. He walks up to his house. What's the first thing to come out? His only daughter. Walks out the door and she's so happy. She goes, that boy, I heard the news. So great, man. You won the battle. God is with you. He begins Egyptah. Because he realized he made a vow to the Lord to offer the first thing that came out is a sacrifice to God. I don't know what he was thinking was going to come out, like a dog or a pig or a or, or, or chicken. I mean, I'm not sure what he was thinking was going to come out, but obviously daughter wasn't on the top of his list. But it was a foolish vow. We need to be careful what we say. Too often we'll make a statement and then afterwards think, huh, was that a good thing or a bad thing? Don't say it until you've thought about it. Don't make foolish promises, especially when it pertains to the Lord. But that brings us to a fourth thing we want to look at. And that's wise counsel. We've looked at wise kings. We've looked at wise finances. We've looked at wise words. Perikapat, wise counsel. And we look back at verse 5. And we find the wise counsel is deep. For the counsel in the heart of a man is like a deep water. But someone with understanding can draw it out. I want to dig in this a little deeper because this is really interesting. The suggestion is, Ang to'od pinsar ko. What I'm really thinking, my motivation is not here, it's deep down inside me. Why am I doing what I'm doing? What is actually what is making me make the decisions and the choices that I'm making? To find that out is not easy. You have to draw it out like out of a well. The long gate, you have to scoop it out from down deep to find out truly what's in the heart of a man. When I was in Bible college, rewind 30 some odd years, there was one student who believed in purgatory. Now, you may not find that unusual, but in Calvary Chapel Bible College, it was unique. There was not a single other student in the entire campus who believed in purgatory. And everybody else just avoided him. They thought, they just ignored him. But I was curious, why does he believe in purgatory? That's not a typical doctrine, especially amongst Calvary chapels. So one day I sat down with him and began to question him. 
Why do you think there should be purgatory? Where does this come from? And he had some verses of the Bible that he pulled out. They, they didn't really make sense. But I started asking him who he was, what he had been through in life. How were his parents? Oh, hula lang anay. Iginikan na may problema. Iatatay. He had left the family, had an affair, walked away with another woman. And he was very angry with his father because he saw how much it hurt his mother. He wanted his father to suffer. He wanted his father to pay the price for what he'd done to his mom. But he did not want his father to go to hell. <laughs> he did not want to see his father eternally separated by God into an everlasting darkness. So, lo and behold, what did he come up with? Purgatory. <laughs> Let my dad suffer for, you know, a thousand, two thousand years, maybe ten, depending on you know, we're flexible in the amount of time. Basta lay machagnon sa kikit sa iya, pero yung kadugay, pwede mo watcha para mabalangit. They didn't get out. This is where it came from. You had to, though, dig deep. You were not going to get that answer without spending time learning about the person. And this is the idea. A man of wisdom understands how to draw out the depths of what's in the heart of an individual. We also, though, want to be wise as it pertains to war. Look at verse 18. Jump down with me. For we're told plans are established by counsel. By wise counsel, you may wage a war. And the idea is, make sure you get good advice. All the more so when it pertains to making very important decisions, like going to war. As a king, mind you, see how it, Solomon, he was someone in charge. He had to make decisions about battles and plans and fighting other nations, although there were no wars in Solomon's day, fortunately. But he understood that a king, you don't go to war lightly. When you have to make a major choice, a major decision, seek wise counsel. Make sure that you receive good advice before you make that choice. You may be aware about 20 years ago, the United States went to war with Iraq back when Saddam Hussein was the president of Iraq. Now the whole justification behind that war was is that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. He was building nuclear weapons and chemical weapons. That's what was the pretext to justify a war. Turned out it was all a lie. None of it was true. A nation went to war with another nation. Thousands of people died because of bad counsel, bad advice. This is why you don't want to take these things lightly. Now the application for us, not that you should go to war. Please don't go to war. That's not a good thing to do. But if we have a major decision to make, maybe it might be who we marry. If it might be, what do we get as our degree in, in college? Or, or maybe, you know, what do we do with our kids? Or just getting along. We have a major life-altering decision. Something that's very profound and important. Don't make rash choices. Seek godly counsel before you make those decisions so that we can be confident in the ways and that the, the choices, that the decisions that we make. This is the idea. Seek wisdom before you make major decisions. But there's a third truth that we receive in light of this wise counsel. And that's the fact that it's hard to know which way to go. Look at verse 24. Jump down a couple of verses. A man's steps are of the Lord. But how then can a man understand his own way? This first man, the word is a strong man. We would say a godly man, strong in his faith. The man who's strong in his faith, who's strong in the Lord, God directs his steps. Pero in Gadoa, Lalaki, the second man, is an ordinary man, an unbelieving man. Since he doesn't have the Lord, how can he possibly know the way to go? And this is, by the way, profound truth. For we cheat, we do cheat. We cheat in life because we know who knows what will happen tomorrow. Para sa mga tao, impossible gidi na. Not a one of us can see what's going to happen in the future. We do not see buwas, this one semana, this one bulan, this one tuig, hindi pa We don't see the future, neither do those who are in the world. But 
God does. And knowing that God does see the future, we can go to God and he can tell us what the future holds. And that's the contrast. The way forward is hidden, but to the man who seeks the Lord, he can find the counsel, the wisdom and how to go forward. For God will direct his steps. Better get the pusan. Verse 27, wise counsel comes from the heart. For the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all of the inner depths of his heart. Or literally, the Lord is the light that shines into our spirit and reveals what's in our heart. I like that. People don't know what we're thinking. I'm glad, by the way. Can you imagine if people could read our thoughts? I could delicado girina. And your thoughts would be projected so they could read them? Oh, that might not be good. People might get really upset if they knew what we were thinking, especially driving in Bacola, let's be honest. We don't want people to see our thoughts, but God does. There is nothing hidden from the Lord. Go back to Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3. He searches out the hearts, the innermost parts. He knows every thought, every word, every action. All are revealed before him. Therefore, we need to be wise and know that even our thoughts are not hidden from our God. We are wise to make sure that we control, we submit to the power of the Spirit to be able to maintain that control over our thoughts because the Lord even will one day judge those. Go back to Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13. We will one day have to give an account before the one who sees everything. So wisdom, wise counsel is knowing that God sees even the innermost thoughts. But that brings us to Katapusan. To the fifth and final thing we want to look at, which is the path of wisdom. I like this a lot. For this speaks of the problem that we all have and the solution that God gave. Look at verse 6. For verse 6 begins to paint the picture. Most men will proclaim each his own goodness, but who can truly find a faithful man? The point is simple. Men think they are good. But show me someone who genuinely has faith. If you were to walk down the street, pick anybody you want to, and you ask them the question, they'll all say that. Genuinely, almost every single person you find is going to respond they are a good person. There's a problem. They're wrong. Because there is no one good. Psalms chapter 14, verse 1. Everyone is a sinner. Everyone has walked away from the Lord. There is none who's good. No, not even one. They think they're good because they compare themselves to others. Mas buot ko kompara sa You know, this guy over here, you know, Alfred goes and, and preaches in the prisons every Friday. And I got to say, if you ever want to feel like a good person, that's a good spot to go. You walk into a prison, you see the guys behind the bars and you go, hey, I'm pretty good. (laughs) I'm not them. I'm not behind the bars. It's always easy to find someone. But that's our standard, not God's. That's how we define good, not how God does. What's God's standard of goodness? Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Walla gid salah. Only those who've never sinned can be good. Therefore, there are none who are good. And this is Solomon's point. Men proclaim their goodness, but show me a man who genuinely has faith. Because none are pure. Jump down to verse 9. Solomon's going to make his case. He's going to enforce this idea we are not good. For Proverbs chapter 20, verse 9 says, Who can say, I've made my heart clean? And I am pure from sin. Here's your question. Are you clean? Can you say that? 
Can anyone declare with honesty and in truth, I am clean, my heart is clean, I am pure from sin? Uh, no, that's, that's difficult to say. In fact, it's impossible to say because all of us have sin. When Halal was a little kid, speaking of good timing, I'm just bringing you into this. She walked in, you're perfect in your timing, girl. When Halal was a little kid, we did not want to give her markers. By the way, Biskimangawata, do not give them markers. Why don't you give, there's a reason why they have washable markers. Because if you give a child a marker, what are they going to do? They're going to write all over the walls. And when they're done with the walls, where are they going to go to next? They're going to write all over themselves. It's just what they do. Every child does this. Children write all over themselves with markers. This is why the worst thing a child can ever get is a permanent marker. You always are fearful when a child finds a Sharpie. Because when they find a Sharpie, they're not wise enough to know that that's not a washable marker. What do they do with a Sharpie? Same thing. They're writing all over themselves and you're going, I got it. That's going to take weeks, if not months, before that will finally go away. You cannot wash off a Sharpie. It is permanent. It's going to stick. This is what sin does. When we sin, it's like a permanent marker on our soul. It's like a permanent marker upon our heart. And there's nothing that you can do to get it off. No matter how much you rub, no matter how hard you scrub, it will not go away. Who can clean themselves? No one. Who can say my heart is pure? No one. We are scarred. We are marked by our sin and it is permanent. And no effort that we will ever give it will remove it and prove that we are good. Because the proof is right there for everybody to see. Jump down to verse 11. For Solomon goes on to say, Even a child is known by his deeds, whether he is pure and right, and the hearing of the ear and the seeing of the eye, the Lord has made both of them for us. So get the picture. Pisikin sa mga bata na lang, gamay pa sila, kapag ako nabuod, ako nabasaway sila by watching what they do. If you see a little kid, and you know who they are, and you have, let's say, some chocolates out on the counter, the book mga bata, medyo kalayo, they know they're not supposed to have those, they stay far away. They stay far away. Ang pasaway mga bata, you see them get closer and closer. And you know, they're, they're Pasuwa kids. You know who they are. Their actions prove who they are, who their character, that they're going to get themselves in trouble. That's even with little kids. How much more with us? God has given us eyes. He's given us ears. We can see and we can hear what people do and we know they are not good. You can do this as an experiment. Get a bunch of people, get your family together. It's fun if you do this with your family, you'll, you'll have a great time, I promise. Gather your family and say, if you're a good person, raise your hand. All hands, will, everybody's hand will go up. I promise you, everyone's hand will go up. Then you ask a question. Okay, if you are good, I've got a couple questions for you. Have you ever lied? Hand goes down. If the hand didn't go down, by the way, they are lying and therefore a liar because everybody has lied. So regardless if they say they've lied or not, they're a liar. Then you can ask, myself again, have you ever coveted? There is a major difference between lying and coveting. Lying is something we say. What is coveting? It's strictly in our heads. You never do anything. You never say anything. It is nothing that is external. It is strictly internal. It's just as much sin. Who's ever wanted something? That's sin. Every hand goes down because I guarantee you that is absolutely every single person. Now you ask a third question. How many sins does it take to make a sinner? Let me put it another way. How many lies does it have to take before we become a liar? One. How many times do we have to steal before we become a thief? Once. How many times do we sin before we become a sinner? Once. We are all sinners. Our eyes and our ears tell us there really is no question. The problem that we face is none of us are pure. None of us are righteous. None of us are good. But there is a solution. Look at verse 29. Jump down with me. 
Verse 29, Solomon paints a beautiful answer to the problem of sin. He says, first and foremost, the glory of young men is their strength, but the splendor of an old man is their gray hair. By the way, I feel like I got robbed on that one. I didn't get much gray hair because I don't have any hair. So I guess it's, it's the splendor of the old man is his gray hair or just no hair. Take it what you want to take it as. The thought though is this. When we're still young, we think we're good enough, strong enough. We can be somehow righteous in our own efforts, in our own abilities. But when we get older, we realize how foolish that is. In our gray hair, in our wisdom, we go, The older we get, the more we learn just how much we need help. And the solution, verse 30, it goes right on into it, is blows that hurt cleanse away evil as the stripes of the inner depths do the heart. So, don't miss. If you want to be clean, what needs to happen? You need to be beaten so that you can be cleansed. You need to be whipped so that your heart will be purified. And you go, well, that sounds really unpleasant. Don't worry. It's not for us. Don't miss the picture. It is incredible. Who was bruised? Who was beaten? By whose stripes are we healed? Our cleansing is not something that we do. It's something that someone did for us. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. And by his stripes we are healed. What is the solution to not being a good person? Jesus who went and died upon the cross to pay the price for our sin. He did what we could not that would be righteous before God. And that, get the pusan gid, is what brings a blessed life. Look to the very last verse we're going to tackle, which is verse 7. Beautiful verse to finish on. The righteous man walks in his integrity and his children are blessed after him. Now the picture and the point is this. The one who recognizes in the Bo'ot Kita, we are Pasuai, we are sinners, and comes to Jesus Christ who was beaten, bruised, he was striped for us, becomes righteous. That's what makes us right and good. And basta righteous, Nikita, that's what allows us to lead a godly life. The word integrity means we walk in uprightness, we walk in the truth. And that's not just for us. Para sa atong mga bataman, atong mga apo. If we are righteous, if we found that key to being good before God, we now can pass it on to others and give them that same truth. And this is the ultimate hope that Solomon wanted to give. The answer to the problem is Jesus, not just for us, for our children, their children, so on and so forth. It'll always be the only answer to standing before a holy and righteous God. The solution, the why solution, is in Jesus Christ. Lord, salam again, aliwa para sinigabi. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to get into the wisdom of your word this evening, Father, as we have continue working our way through Lord, the Proverbs. And just pray, Lord, that you do. Let us realize the power and the truth, Lord, that, Lord, we're not good. That is such a freeing concept. Because it's not about our righteousness, it's not about our efforts. There's nothing we could do to ever remove that stain of sin upon our heart. Lord, there's only one thing that's powerful enough to remove it, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, you were beaten, you were bruised. It's by your stripes we are forgiven. And Lord, that's what brings righteousness. Lord, that's what gives us a good life. And so Lord, let us walk in your wisdom, walk in your truth, live our life, following and representing you. We pray and ask. In Jesus' name we say, Amen. Amen.